Well, as it turned out, the squadron had no spare parts and almost no tools. They had been abandoned during the Dunkirk disaster, which turned out pretty good in the end. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers were saved. But as Churchill said, there's no victory in retreat. Nevertheless, it was a great coup d'etat early in the war. Parts had been requisitioned, but to no avail, as official channels were bunged up. Furious, Bader barked at the men, telling them they had to shape up and wear shirts and ties. They replied they only had the shirts on their bloody backs and no spare ones to boot. No wonder they smelled so damn rank. Hard to wash your mingy apparel if the only garb you have is hanging on your stinking bloody backside. Bader was shocked and immediately apologized profusely and straight away requisitioned an allowance for loss of kit. Parts, tools, and kits were now all lost in the bumbling bureaucratic paper chase. Next thing you know, Bader is telling his commanding officer that his squadron is no longer operational. Evidently, it didn't go over too well with the brass. And the shit hit the fan. And the commander-in-chief was furious. The very next day, Mallory arrives and notifies him that Sir Hugh Dowding wanted to visit him. Shit! He's never had a red carpet visit before. He thought that carpet was only in the Priory. Evidently not. Bader must have stood strong and sweet-talked Stuffy, as they called him, and the matter was settled. It must have been quite a meeting. At any rate, the very next day at precisely nine o'clock, sharp, a plethora of lorries arrived with crates of wheels, sparks, spark plugs, spanners, pistons and rings, engines, props, and all manner of parts and pieces for hurricanes, and everything you need to put them in, and everything you need to haul them out. And in one lorry there were kits for all of the men, as well as ground crew, and an abundance of soap, razors, and even some cologne. They soon looked better, felt better, and smelled a hell of a lot better. The boys were impressed, and, and their respect for him was instantaneous. Bader soon honed their aerial skills, and in no time at all, they would have followed him into hell. For that, for in a way, that was exactly where they were going. And I might add, on the double. Well, the very next day, Tin Legs, a name they liked to call him, very fondly, by the way, wrote out a note that stated Squadron 242 fully operational. Now, interestingly enough, Bader had a secret advantage. You see, when the fighter pilots were in a dive and pulled out, they could pull as much as seven or eight Gs. And when they did, the blood tended to pool in their legs because they were sitting. Well, they would black out. And blacking out was not a good thing to do in a dog-eat-dog -dog fight. At any rate, Bader, because he had both of his, his legs hacked off, didn't have a lot of spare room for the blood to pool down there in his lower extremities. 
they were gone, and as a result, he discovered he could pull more G's than anyone and cut even tighter circles for a longer duration than anybody else. Of course, this gave him a distinct advantage, apart from the fact that he thought he was totally invincible. Well, he was given the task and honor of, of leading the Lucky Duxford Wing, the largest fighter formation of the war. The problem was organization. Even with RDF, radio direction finding, we now call it radar, the unwieldy formation took too long to form. The spits had to wait on the slower dam hurricane and as a result, they were often not on time for the big show. They were, to say the least, no-shows all too often. And as it turned out, the big wing, as it was also called, wasn't so ducky, because in it laid an egg and not of the Midas variety either. So it was soon disbanded. Ah. Sir Mallardly wasn't in favor from the start anyway. Through the summer of 40, they fought like madmen, and many fell. Bader and the boys' job was to attack the slower bombers, while the Spitfires took on the covering Messerschmitts, for they were the speediest combatants. Bader and the boys were in Cane, so their job was to clobber as many bombers as they could. So, clobber they did. Taking on the huge bomber formations was a formidable task How to do it? Bader's theory was to hit them head on. Go for the jugular. So he did. A bit risky, but what the hell? He reasoned with only one gun up front behind bulletproofless plexiglass. Made it more vulnerable. The other guns couldn't draw a bead up front, unlike the rear. That would be just like DB. I told you he, he was invincible. The other boys weren't too sure. Nevertheless, as always, they followed him into the cauldron. God, they were brave. When the blitz of bombing cities began September 7th, it took the pressure off of the fighter squadrons and the Luftwaffe casualties rose precipitously. It was a whole nother ball game, this night fight and stuff, but Bader was, was ready to go day or night. It didn't matter to him. He loved it all. Well, August 9th, 1941, Bader clobbers another Messi in France. It was his 21st kill. The trouble was the second 109 rammed him over enemy territory. This was his 22nd kill, as well as his last. The collision severed the fuselage behind the cockpit, and the tail and fin were all gone. Bye-bye. There was a gaping hole behind him, and he was in a slow 400-mile-per-hour spin. The spin was slow, but his rate, rate of speed was faster and greased lightning. 